Uh, first uh, order of business is to approve the meeting minutes from December 9th, 2020. Um, do we uh, do we have any comments or corrections to consider? This is KM. I would move approval. Thank you, KM. Good morning. Good morning. Support. Support by Jim or Greg. 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 Thanks, Greg. Uh, any other comments or corrections? <coughs> if not, I'll ask if there's anyone who would like to vote nay on this motion. Hearing none, the motion carries. Carries. Uh, next is, uh, next is uh, December 31 financial. December 31 financial. Oh, I'm getting a. Oh, I'm getting a. Did, Jessica, did you need to jump in? Sorry. Jump in. Sorry. Oh. Yeah, if that's oh. okay, real quick. Sorry, Jessica. For Sorry, that. Jessica. Oh, forgot. that's okay. You guys um, got rolling quickly. So um, you might recall that um, Public Act 254 of 2020 extended the authorization for public bodies to hold virtual meetings. And one of the very quirky requirements of the new act is that board members at the outset of the meeting, which is the only reason I wanted to jump in sort of quickly, um, at the outset of the meeting, board members are supposed to announce that they are attending remotely and also their location. And this can be either the county or the city or the township or the village and the state that you're in. So as silly as that seems, and while I can't really explain any sort of rationale to you, that is, that is a requirement of the new law. So if everybody wouldn't mind sort of as part of an attendance thing, just announcing that you are attending remotely, and then announcing your location. And again, it can be as vague as just the county and the state that you're in. Okay, so okay, so Jim, why don't we Jim, why don't we almost do like a roll? Almost do like a roll. And then uh, I'll and start. Then, uh, I'll start. Rick Wynn. Rick I'm Wynn. I'm in Spring Rapids. And you're attending remotely. And I'm attending remotely. And I'm attending remotely. <laughs> Thank you. This We're is getting a little echo. Yeah. Jessica, there you go. Okay, go ahead, Cam. Um, this is Cam Dunn. I am attending remotely, and I am in Grand Rapids, Michigan. This is Diana Seeger. I'm attending remotely, and I'm in the beautiful city of Grand Rapids, Michigan. How about Greg? Uh, Greg McNeely, attending remotely in uh, beautiful, sunny, cold, and chilly Grand Rapids, Michigan. <laughs> Jim Talon. Jim oh, and sorry. I thought I thought I already did it, but I was muted. Uh, Jim <laughs> Talon re attending remotely Grand Rapids, Michigan. Mayor. The mayor got booted. Um, she just texted and is logging back in. Okay. And, and uh, Jermail Eddie just texted me and he is having trouble getting into the meeting. Okay. Right. We have Jen on the call. Jen is not here today. Okay. And Luis, I don't see just yet. Not on yet. So we actually don't have a quorum now. Oh, great. great. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, yeah. Why don't we wait? wait? Second. Jamail Jamil. thinks that there might be a link error. I don't know. Um, Amanda or Mandy, yeah, yeah. would you be able to check in? I'm sending that to him directly again. Okay. Wonder why we're getting the declaration. Uh, so the mayor is rebooting. She lost uh, internet, so she might be a minute. Okay. Okay. Uh, so you so want to talk about, about vaccines? vaccines. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to start all that. We're going to have to have that conversation over again. Yeah. yeah. Oh, all right. I see Jermail's name on the, the list now. He, he, just, he just got on. So. Okay. Yep. Just got here. Thank you. Hey, Jermail. 
Hello, so good morning. We would need you to announce uh, that you're attending remotely and where are you attending from, the city and state? Um, I'm attending from uh, the lovely Prospect Avenue Palace, my home uh, here in Grand Rapids. Okay. So now we have a quorum. We do have a quorum now. Okay. So we are, uh, we're at the item number three, which is the December 31 financials uh, with Ms. Chapman, correct? Did yes. Okay. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Um, the December statements, as you'll see, are pretty normal um, expenditures, um, regular things that we pay every every month. Um, largest expenditures were in streetscape and on um, the arena plaza improvements. Um, you'll see that uh, the authority is obviously still doing very well and in a good, strong cash position. I'm happy to answer any questions or to do, dig into any details or do any research if anyone um, has anything they have questions on. Any uh, questions? This is Greg. I, yeah, Greg. Uh, this, yeah, this is Greg. I just had a sort of a general question if we had a, a um, if not a formal uh, revisement, but just maybe a, a theory on, now that we're six months through on revenue for uh, the, the year, just noting that it seems to be a little bit down from, from budget, just um, uh, what are our expectations for uh, the next six months? Um, I w a lot of that revenue that we're still down is bringing our interest earnings back up from the mark to market reversal that we had in June and reversed in July. Um, you know, can't control the market. Hopefully at this point we will, our interest earnings will still be up. Um, there will be again at the end of this year, another mark to market entry, which depending on where the market's at, you know, who knows how that goes. Um, but that's where uh, the, a lot of the dip in the, in the revenue actually is. Um, yeah. And I'd, I'd add to that, um, Greg. So our, our local tax increment, which is our um, tax increment funding is actually above budget for the year because um, property taxes raise in uh, the non tax funds is where we're seeing, I think the most significant impacts because of the lack of parking on the dash lots on the West side. Um, parking has started again over there, obviously, as there's more activity, but it's still going to be down. You know, I think we're right now we're um, trending toward coming in at about 30 to 40 percent of that of the overall budget. And that's just money that we're probably going to struggle to make up. So we'll have to, you know, as we move into the next fiscal year, that's something we're going to have to be mindful of. So, Tricia, so, just a question to uh, explain the fund to balance. Uh, the, the fund to fund balance because that's for the local inc tax increment it was budgeted at four million and that's just um saying that we budgeted to spend 3.9 million of funds that we didn't collect this year we have collected in the past years but didn't spend it yeah okay so but it, you, there's nothing in the actual column no yeah um because when that's spent, it's actually it's spent out of fun, that fund balance. Um, it, it, it wouldn't come in again as revenue. It came in as revenue in past fiscal years. Hmm. OK. So on the budget side, it's showing as, you know. Of revenue available to be spent, but it's not a current year revenue. OK. And, you know, the statements could be presented slightly different. Um, these interim statements are not governed by GAAP. They, you know, they can, we can show this information in, in whatever way the board wants to see it. This is the way Jana had, had done it in the past, so I continued doing it that way. Um, but it, you know, it wouldn't have to be like that if, if you didn't want it to. We could come up with a new format and maybe something to discuss outside of this meeting. OK, I think maybe. I mean, I think it's more apparent because of the year that we're in. It makes it more 
obvious or uh, sure. But, um, OK, so are there any other questions regarding the statements? Um, if not, I would need a motion to accept statement D, which are the the warrants for yes, thank you. So move. This is Luis. Thank you, Luis. Support. We have a, thanks, Greg. Support. Any other questions or comments? Does Luis need to introduce himself and confirm where he is before he's able to make a motion? Yes, Luis. Being super technical. Yeah. <laughs> Luis, we have, we have a new wrinkle uh, yeah. for you. Uh, Jessica, do you want to just walk through that again real quickly? Sure. So um, the act that extended the authorization for public bodies to meet virtually contains a lot of quirks. And one of them is that board members are supposed to <clears throat> announce that they are attending remotely and then secondly, announce their location. It, it can be very vague. You can just say the county and the state that you're in. This, this, by the way, this rule does not apply to people who are attending remotely because they are on military duty. Um, but anyway, so just perhaps at the beginning of meetings from now on, do a quick attendance roll call and just have them do this. Thanks, Amanda, for catching that. Well, thank you. Then I would like to announce that I am Luis Avila and I am attending from Grand Rapids, Michigan. And you are attending remotely, correct? And I am attending remotely. OK. All right, I think we have everybody. Uh, unless the mayor gets back on. Right? Yeah, we'll, we'll just have to remind her when she logs okay. back in. OK. Um, all right, so we have a motion and a second. Uh, is there anybody uh, on the board that would like to vote no for this motion? Hearing none, motion carries. Next, we have the uh, fiscal year 2020 audit. Trisha, you're up again. Yes, um, we actually have Marie Stiegel on the line from Plant Moran. She is one of our auditors. Um, she is going to explain the um, the audit process, uh, the letter to the board, um, and just go over a few things with you guys. Um, I do believe Marie was on the line. Yes, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. All right, great. Well, thank you for having me this morning. Um, Trisha had asked me to cover the results of the audit for the GDA for the year ended June 30th, 2020. Um, first, I just wanted to cover the audit opinion that we issued on the financial statements. And based on our audit, we were able to issue an unmodified opinion. That's the best audit opinion you can receive from the auditor. It indicates that based on our audit, the financial statements fairly present the DDA's financial position. The other deliverable that we provide as part of the audit is the end of audit letter. This is included in your packet. Um, it's on page 14 of the PDF, and it's um, a letter that says to the board members at the top. This letter really contains two sections. Um, first, any communications related to internal control matters, and second, any required communications between the auditor and the board members. Um, the second page of this document that says section one at the top, this is the communications related to internal control matters. And there was one reportable item related to internal controls, and it just related to a year end journal entry that was identified as part of the audit process. So really our auditing standards require us to report certain entries identified as part of the audit process to you, the board members, if the dollar amount is significant enough or could be significant, which is the reason that it's being reported in this letter. And so the entry that's described here at the bottom of um, the second page was an adjustment to the recorded liability related to the school tax capture. So this was basically the, the recorded liability for the amount to be given back to the schools. Um, 
really the adjustment resulted from the fact that, you know, a key individual um, who generally would calculate this liability based on the required um, form submitted to the state um, left the position. And so uh, in the original accounting records that we received for audit, the amount recorded as a liability was the same as last year. But based on the increase in the overall tax capture, um, this amount needed to be increased. Um, it was, again, related to a year-end entry um, for accrued liability. It did not impact amounts actually paid to the schools. Um, of course, as a part of the corrective action for this, um, as you know, the position um, has since been filled by um, Tricia, of course, and um, it'll be noted that this would be reviewed um, going forward. Any questions on that before I begin, or I can just finish and take questions at the end. I think you can continue. OK, great. Um, page three of the letter, which says section two at the top, begins the required communications between the auditor and the board. Um, much of this letter contains language that's really boilerplate. It's required by auditing standards. Um, but on an overall basis, some of the key items to note were that there were no new accounting standards that were required to be implemented this year. Um, GASB did issue a, a delay in some of the required auditing standards due to the pandemic. Um, so there were no new standards required this year uh, for the 2020 audit. And we didn't identify any significant difficulties in, in performing the audit or any disagreements with management. Um, so that pretty much covers the, the high level um, you know, highlights of that letter. Um, again, I'm happy to open it up for any um, questions you may have for me at this time. I, I would like to thank you know, the, the city staff for their assistance during the audit process. Um, this year, the audit was completed entirely remotely due to the circumstances. So, um, you know, thanks to Tricia and, and other staff in the comptroller's office and fiscal services who really head up this effort. Any questions? These are um, complicated financials, so <laughs> to yes. say the least. Mr. Chair, M Mr. Yes, Chair just, a, uh, uh, just a comment, and that is, uh, um, kudos to the to the staff with the complexity, the variety of organizations that we're dealing with, and it's a public body dealing with public funds uh, that are highly regulated and transparent. There's a lot of moving parts and a lot of checks being cut. Uh, so just kudos for uh, a clean report that doesn't happen by accident that requires intentionality. Um, so thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. And Tricia, if we haven't officially welcomed you as our <laughs> as a team member um, handling these complicated financials, then um, kudos to you too. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I believe we need to accept the audit, correct? That's right. Yep. So we need a motion to accept the fiscal year 2020 audit as presented. So moved. Thank you, Greg. We have a second. Second. Thanks, Luis. Any other comments or questions? Uh, is there anyone on the board then that would like to vote no for this motion? Hearing none, I don't think that was a no vote. Right? <laughs> that sounded like a fire alarm. I know. Hearing none, uh, that motion carries as well. Thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, the winner ready grant recommendations. Uh, Mark was going to present this for us, right, Tim? That's right. Yeah, and I believe he's on the line. I am. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so you guys have the memo uh, that that spells out some of the things that we'd like to talk about and, and have action with. Uh, the, the, this grant discussion is really about two things. It's, it's uh, an authorization for approval of eight businesses that are requesting grant funding amounts that are in excess of the 15,000 staff level approval, uh, noting that the memo only lists six, but since the memo was written, we've had two additional 
uh, businesses make requests since last Friday. So that's a that's a distinction in in the memo from from um, what we're talking about today. And then the second item is is really to have a discussion and potential action regarding potential items to the DDA funding per businesses uh, for amounts that are over the $15,000 staff level. And so I'm going to start with this second item uh, because I think it plays into the first item. And before that, it, it's gonna be helpful to frame where we are with the winter ready grant as of today. So the memo indicates a total of 110,000 had been authorized for grant funding. That amount has increased to 144,000 since the memo was written last week. So there's now $144,000 that have been allocated to cover uh, 11 businesses. So that's an average of about 13,000 per business. And then in addition to those businesses that have previously been funded, we have serious interest from an additional 20 businesses with a preliminary estimate of about $280,000 in requested funding. And four of those requests are expected to be in excess of $20,000. Now, obviously those are anticipated. Uh, when I say serious interest, we basically have uh, a confirmation from a, a particular business that wants to do this. Uh, and then we have to sort of go through it with them and figure out how we're gonna permit it and how we're gonna go through the process of it. Oftentimes some of those fall out, but in what we've learned in the last few weeks is that oftentimes additional ones get added as we go through that process. So that's in addition to those 11 that have already been funded and the eight that we will discuss later as part of this action. So the potential amount with those two groups is, um, uh, is two is four hundred and twenty four thousand dollars expected so then if you consider the eight that we're requesting in this memo uh that that's a total of amount of about two hundred and six thousand dollars so now we're nearing a, a total of about six hundred and thirty thousand dollars for the grant so that's sort of a snapshot of where we are and where we might anticipate being in the future and it's also uh, just uh, probably helps to give some background as, as we discuss maybe potential limits. Um, the funding requests continue to emerge. And so I guess the question becomes, should limits be placed to ensure that the grant funding can be maintained uh, as we proceed for the next few months? And I, I think that that's something that the board should probably consider as we, we talk about these eight that, that are um, before us today. So in a nutshell, there's, there's really three different options for these limits that, that I'm talking about that are over the $15,000 staff level. Uh, the memo is recommending a not to exceed amount of $20,000 per business, uh, and then a not to exceed amount of 26,000 for entities that would provide a common area for multiple businesses to use. Uh, that would be like Studio Park, which we've already approved, or you've already approved, or the downtown market, which is, is uh, on the docket today. A second option, uh, in lieu of those thresholds, this board could offer or establish a different set of limits. And then a potential third option is we could just continue to keep things the way that they are and take each of these as a case-by-case -case basis, knowing that um, there may be some that are in the twenty dollars to $30,000 range as we proceed through uh, these next steps. Uh, so, so really a good example of what these options mean are, are exemplified in the eight requests that are, that are in this memo or the six that are in this memo and then the two additional ones that we're seeking DDA approval for today. Uh, if each of those applications were granted the amount requested, the total would be $206,000. If instead we use the $20,000, $26,000 thresholds, uh, the total amount would be 171,000. So that's a difference of about $35,000 uh, just with those eight today. Uh, so it sort of gives you a magnitude of where we are and, and, and I think maybe a little bit more uh, topic for discussion. So I'll sort of stop there for the moment and, and see if you have any questions about that. Uh, if you wanna discuss it further before we review the specifics of the eight, or if you'd just like to pr proceed with the, the discussion about the eight. I have a, uh, can I ask a question first? Um, yes. So Tim and Mark, when when we say there's um, X amount of funds remaining, 
Is this from the original 1 million that we set aside? I, mean, I believe that's from the initial grant amount that was approved, Mark, but um, yeah, we so initially there was uh, well total after the, the two approvals, there were three hundred and seventy five thousand dollars total in the winter ready grant overall in COVID relief funding. We had a million dollars budgeted for FY 21. Okay. If you look at the December 31 financials that were just approved of that million, we still have seven hundred and twenty five thousand. Um, not spent now that that doesn't account necessarily for things that have been authorized but we haven't cut checks for um, but that is currently the balance in that fund so i think um uh, not a concern but uh since these are uh, all non-tax funds correct no there's um a portion in both local and non-tax the non-tax the remaining amount is a little over five hundred thousand, and in the local tax it's a little over 220. okay so uh, i think um i think the one thing that um i would at least for shedding some light on just um for the non-tax funds of course we can anticipate very little revenue coming in this year i would guess uh, based on the last six months and then moving forward during covid um, not to say that um, uh, i guess my question would be that or comment maybe is that it, we need to be somewhat um, aware that we're spending previous funds we have money in those funds so that's not a, an issue but um typically we would spend uh and you know have 1.5 million or whatever it is coming in from the non-tax funds uh, so this year we do not but so I, I would i would only like to be mindful or when we uh, bring these things to the board that we can acknowledge the overall budget uh, I think that's more important than um, even one specific grant um, in my mind, at least. So, um, so I think um, I, I think I'd, it'd be nice to have some board discussion on on the options that Mark presented, so that we could sort of re come to a conclusion as to. I feel like we should have some guidelines. Uh, if we take it a case by case basis, I feel like we're going to have someone feel like they're not being treated fairly. That potentially could happen. Um, so I think we should establish some guidelines uh, moving forward unless you all disagree. Um, someone has their hand up. It looks like KM has her hand up. OK, KM. Yes. Um do we have any obligation to expend these funds before the end of the fiscal year is one question and two is perhaps it's too early but do we have any evidence of benefit of these um, actions that are being taken is it working is it helping does it make a difference so those are my questions thank you I think on the yeah. first one I can answer, Mark, um, from the fiscal year standpoint, we don't have any obligation to spend them necessarily. And then, um, you know, I think your point about it maybe being a little early on the, to understand the benefits is probably right. Uh, but Mark, do you want to talk a little bit about how some of the anecdotes of businesses have been sharing? Yeah, uh, I think that obviously we, we talk to these businesses. Uh, I, I'm talking to multiple businesses uh, uh, weekly and the ones that we have we have put in or that they have put in and that we've supported um, are doing quite well um, I think we can look at um, reserve has some up right now that seem to be working really well they they they're um, uh, helping them a great deal actually from what we've talked to them about over the course of the last couple of weeks uh, House of Wine has had his up the longest, I think, and they are, I mean, essentially, 
for him, they've they've saved his business to this point. I mean, he wouldn't be. I, I don't think he would be in business today if he didn't have some of this uh, support. Uh, his are full most of the time. He takes reservations for them. Has does reserve. Um, I think in talking with. Field and Fire, who also had some up early up on Monroe North, uh, they are they are doing quite well with theirs. There's a lot of people using them, a lot of interest in them. Uh, City Built uh, has their their uh, structure up now, and it's being used by m multiple uh, businesses, as we found out. So he's not really essentially using that as a as a place for just his business. But I, he told me the other day that. He had somebody from um, East Town, uh, uh, from Wolfgang's, who had their their uh, brunch there and brought it to the his structure to eat. Um, uh, and then Field and Fire, I think, is using some of that as overflow. So I know that those three are functioning quite well. Um, I think that the the structures. You'll note that the Studio Park has three or four more greenhouses up. Um, Knowing that there's there is a great deal of interest in people still sitting outside, Uccello's interestingly enough, who just put their their structure up last week, uh, they have seen an influx of uh, business once the the ice rink opened up. Uh, they were flooded actually uh, the first couple of days that that was opened, and they had to scramble staff in order to serve all the people who wanted to be served. And many of those people were just sitting outside under heaters at that point in time. So I think that they are working. And then the other thing that maybe anecdotally that we were seeing is that there's a there is a growing interest since the first of the year uh, from many businesses who were relatively silent during the holiday period. Um, and I'll, I'll point to like uh, maybe brick and porter um, and and in particular recently Osteria Rosa um, and I think some of that has to do with their general uh, feeling that they might not be able to reopen uh, at the end of as this up uh, the state policy is set to expire at the end of this week and I, I, many of them don't feel like that's going to be removed so they're starting to scramble trying to figure out how they can get their staff back up online and how they can start serving people in a safe manner so I think that overall they've been successful. We're installed, and uh, there's also a great deal of interest from other businesses that are seeing them work for their neighbors and wanting uh, their own. I would I would also add that these are not one and done type right. structures. That these um, will be able to be used not only for the winter, but I see these being used as protection from rain during the summer. Um, you know, we can open them up and uh, so outdoor seating can can be year round. So um, I do think this is a longer term investment um, as opposed to just a COVID, um, you know, answer um, for this year. So Mark, for my benefit anyway, can you go over the three options again that you presented to the board for um, policy change or uh, guideline change for this, for these yeah. grants? Yeah, so uh, as, the, as the grant is currently constructed, we as staff are allowed to give up to $15,000 per applicant um, without board approval. And so what we're seeking is anything above the 15,000 as we bring it to the board. Uh, are there parameters or limits to that? Um, because currently we do not have any. So uh, it could be it could be a $50,000 ask. It could be a $30,000 ask. And obviously that's a that's something that would be taken on a case by case basis is what we're sort of doing right now. So that was that was sort of my third option when I was going through the three options. The first option was um, setting some kind of amount and, and the memo recommends that we do a not to exceed amount of twenty thousand dollars per business. And then uh, with an exception that it would be twenty six thousand for entities that provide a common area for multiple businesses like Studio Park 
for the downtown market. And, and knowing that we've already allocated uh, 25,600 to Studio Park in this manner. That's the only one that you've approved up to this point that's over 15,000. And then uh, the second option that I referenced was just um, the board potentially putting a different number in there on a per business basis uh, that we would then establish limits in that way. Or as the third option, as I mentioned, would just be to leave it as it is and, and take them on a case by case basis each time we meet. Does that make Any sense? Comments? KM, you still have your hand up. I think I, I think I saw Greg's hand go up again. I think, yeah. Greg? Yeah, I just had a question. So to, to this question, is there any past precedent of a similar situation, similar program where the DDA has, has a pattern or a practice? Um, just looking if there's a precedent as a guide. It's a good question. The closest one um, that I can think of would have been our um, parklet program. And that cap, if I recall, was um, I think it was $25,000 per parklet. So that these are they're not exactly analogous, but that's a pretty close comparison. Um, yeah. And previously, even prior to that, um, this is more internal to buildings. We had a building reuse incentive program that was capped at 50,000. Um, and so there, there, there is a precedent for caps on our grant programs. Um, and I think in, in looking at this with Mark, we just felt like the 20,000 was probably, um, A, it was pretty close to what some of the request, requests were coming in at. Um, and it just kind of, based on the data that we had, it seemed like a, a reasonable amount um, in, in looking at some of the precedents. So Ms. Mr. Chairman, not to uh, cut off debate, because if there's more questions, uh, we can pause it. But if, if um, just to keep it moving, I would move support of the 20,000 uh, cap option, since it seems to be in line with uh, past practices. Um, but I think Cam raises a really interesting point in terms of the efficacy and whether or not how open-ended or, or should there be a sunset to the, um, uh, the program. I'm not sure how to uh, address that in the motion, uh, but uh, I think there's a lot of merit there and it shouldn't be open-ended. So I guess my question would be, are you including the common, um, the 26,000? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yep. Um, and I, I guess, uh, KM, just for my benefit too, sunsetting, what, what would be your recommendation? I mean, what are you? I'm not sure I have a recommendation on that um, because the future seems a bit uncertain in terms of how we're going to interact socially. So, um, you know, this this seems to have actually a benefit that could go beyond. I've heard mentioned that um, this could be used over the summer. So I, I don't know that there needs to be a sunset to that. I Perhaps we need to evaluate the program at some point down the road. That would make sense to me. I would agree, and I, I'm sure we will. Um, yes, we will. So to clarify the motion, then um, you're moving that we cap an individual grant at 20,000 and a common area grant to 26,000 or more than one that's common to more than one business. Yes, Mr. Chairman. I would support that motion. This is KM. OK, any other comments or questions? Uh, I think this program, um, I anticipate, will be effective in saving some of these businesses, um, uh, particularly the restaurants, So, um, and really help us get through the winter and the summer um, not knowing is exactly what Cam said, not knowing really when this is going to end um, at this point. So um, any other comments? If not, are there is there anyone on the board that would like to vote no for this motion? Hearing none, the motion carries. Thanks, Mark.
Yeah, so the, so there's really a second part to this, and I think that we we probably need to specifically approve the eight that are above the fifteen thousand dollar threshold. Is is that a fair statement? Yes, you are correct. We need okay. a motion to approve those yep. eight that were That's presented. Good. Okay, so so in the memo, six of those eight are pretty well spelled out. Uh, they're their um, the, the downtown market, their brick and porter, the Bob, Mezzo, and Sandy Point Beach House, along with Ando Sushi. Uh, and so those six um, are all would all be capped at the 20,000 with the exception of the downtown market, which is obviously serving multiple businesses. Uh, so they would be they're re actually requesting 25,000, which is under the 26,000 that we just talked about. So that would be those six. And then the additional two that are not in the memo uh, that came in uh, this week or late last week um, is uh, Luna. So what Luna is planning to do is to build a, a large structure in their social zone area, which is the part of the street that's been barricaded off. Uh, and then they're also contemplating several smaller single table shelters that, we've, that we're starting to see pop up in various locations along with some heaters. So he has a, a total expenditure of about 30,000 at this point in time. Uh, under this new guideline, we would be at, uh, we'd be approving 20,000 for him. And then finally, the city built project, uh, which has already been installed and is operational. It's referred to as the Welcome Center. Uh, it's up in Monroe North, obviously, uh, right across the street from city built uh, in, a, in a parking lot in uh, the park. It's a 30 by 60 foot tent uh, with a large tent heater uh, that, that uh, he's using. And uh, as I explained earlier, there's, there's quite a bit of uh, extra businesses using this besides city built. It's sort of this uh, coming together area for various businesses in Monroe North and as we found uh, even in Easttown. Uh, so he is, he's got about $26,000, $27,000 into his project at this point in time. Uh, my interpretation would be that he would fall under the $26,000 that um, would be for a, an entity that's providing multiple uh, or support for multiple different restaurants. So that would bring us to a, to uh, those eight in total. Uh, and I think just approving those would then give us the ability to authorize those grant expenditures uh, in the next week or so. This is KM. I would move approval. Thank you, KM. Support. Support from Luis. Any other comments on this? Is there anyone on the board that would like to vote no for this motion? Hey, I, this is Jeremy. I just had a quick comment. Okay. Um, and this is just just kind of um, highlighting uh, Mark and and his work with that. We've had several conversations together. Myself, him, and the um, I forget the company name that's, that's making some of these, but just definitely just great work. Um, I hit a few roadblocks, and Mark kind of came through to help, um, you know, help me get over them. And I've seen him and heard him working with other businesses as well. So I appreciate um, that support as a business owner, but also as a DDA member, you know, kind of, you know, quote unquote, seeing the dollars at work, so to speak. So yeah, I just wanted to just highlight that. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Jamil. Thanks, Jamil. So again, is there anyone that would like to vote no for this motion? Hearing none, that motion carries as well. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. OK, number six, Portland Lou. Yeah, so this uh, informational item and Mr. Elledge uh, is on the line to kind of give you a quick update on Portland Lou operations. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Hope you're all doing well this morning. Uh, we can just go ahead and dive right in here. So basically, this is just a quick overview of the operations of the Portland Lou since it's been installed uh, back in uh, July 27th. So just a quick little background. We did a pretty targeted survey of the businesses and um, social service entities kind of surrounding the Lou and and in the Heartside neighborhood and we're able to really kind of understand how they sort of observed and, and saw the Lou impacting the neighborhood. So kind of peppered throughout this 
kind of quick presentation are some quotes that were taken directly from the feedback from that survey. And then at the end, we'll kind of dig into those results uh, just a little bit. Um, so some of the, the fun statistics is we've used a, a little over 10,000 gallons of water since uh, the loose operation in, uh, or installation rather in July. Um, and the loo's been cleaned uh, pretty consistently three times per day since its installation, which is, means it's been cleaned well over 200 times um, since going in, in in July. And and here's some pictures of the ambassador's hard at work. Um, that blue picture is always my favorite. If you haven't seen that thing at night, it looks like a spaceship when it's all lit up. It's it's pretty great. Um, but the 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 quality of the the cleaning and the and the fact that it's always so clean when I come and take a look at it and. And that was echoed throughout the survey as well. Um, it's just a testament to the ambassadors and Rebecca's team and, and how well that they're taking care of this thing. And so we knew going into this project that having um, this kind of operational and maintenance support was going to be key to its success. And I think the ambassadors have really done an excellent job at, at making sure that we're delivering on that end of the uh, on, on that end of our bargain. Um, we can take it to the next slide, please. And so kind of using some back of napkin uh, calculations, we've had over 9,000 uh, users use the restroom since its installation with about 90 people using it uh, every single day, uh, which is great. We've also added some landscaping and um, just general beautification to the area surrounding the loo, which uh, if you had seen the bulb out before the, the loo, it did not look like, like that. So. Um, in, in addition to adding some much needed infrastructure to the, the neighborhood, we've also added some greenery and um, just general beautification. We can move to the next slide here. And so this this is the survey results. So we got about uh, pretty close to 30 surveys back, which is pretty good considering we only targeted about 70 businesses and, and social service entities. So right around the halfway mark, give or take. Um, and overwhelmingly, uh, the results were positive, but lots of folks um, not only thought the loo was a great addition to the neighborhood, but they wanted to see more of these types of infrastructure and facilities being added throughout the neighborhood. Um, and hopefully you've had a chance to kind of look through some of the um, the quotes around there, but a, a lot of it is it just talks about the the success of the neighborhood being sort of um, hinging upon sort of these types of infrastructures and and this type of amenities and supports for um, for the pedestrians and the people that are in throughout the neighborhoods. Um, so, so far it seems like it's been um, really well received. The ambassadors uh, have, again, have done a great job cleaning it up. And it seems like, you know, every time I'm down there checking on the loo, somebody walks by and um, asks about it, if it's a bathroom and how excited they are to have that on the corner. And um, I've been down there several times myself and have seen a line queued up for people to use the bathroom. So I think, you know, it's, it's meeting a great need for the neighborhood, but I think there's also some evidence that you know, this is something that we're going to need to do more of in the future as, as there's just continued need for, for items like this. Um, that was the quick and dirty version of that, and I will be happy to answer any questions or engage in any dialogue that we want to have about bathrooms. I'm sure you meant it was the quick and clean version. <laughs> okay. Any questions for Melvin? It looks great. Thanks. Yeah, it looks, right. it's awesome. This is Jim. I have a general question. Just yeah, wondering, if, wondering if anyone has uh, an approximate uh, cost, total cost for installing this amenity. That's a great question, Jim. And it actually came up in a conversation Tim and I had yesterday. I have not yet crunched those numbers, but um, it is something I'll be doing probably by the end of this week, and we can make sure we get that out to you too. One of the things we're trying to look at is the, the total cost of installation of the unit. We want to continue to monitor the ongoing operational costs as well to really understand like how much this thing is is um, costing us. So and great and question. Though. If we're thinking about doing more around downtown, that's an important number to have for sure. Absolutely. Thanks. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing that up, Jim. And that's part of what we'll be looking at as we analyze future locations. I think um, also just kind of as a reminder, this was a three plus year odyssey to get the bathroom installed, and so I think we're we're encouraged by the results um, as we're looking at additional locations. We want to make sure that we're, you know, being as smart and efficient about it as possible. I think we learned quite a bit in terms of, um, you know, the infrastructure required to hook this up and to get it up and running. And so as we're scouting new new spots, we'll we'll keep all that in mind. But happy to share more detail on the, the full cost um, 
as Melvin said this week. Thanks. Cam, you have a question as well or comment? A comment. I want to um, thank Melvin for a really good report. Um, I especially like the humor at the end, but um, I appreciate that because I've had questions about whether this is really working and the number of people using it is actually quite impressive. So thank you very much for what you're doing. Yeah, you're welcome. I was impressed by the numbers too. I, I didn't, wasn't quite sure what to expect and they were, I don't know, they just kind of surprised me. So I agree. Any other questions or comments? Okay, thanks, Melvin. Yeah, thank you guys. Downtown retail presentation, Mr. Kelly. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. I'm going to do uh, kind of an introduction overview here, and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mike Byrne, um, who's been doing some work for us, and I believe Mike is on the call. Uh, but quick uh, background introduction. So back in June uh, 2020, we authorized a scope of work with MJB Consulting to conduct an assessment of retail in downtown. Uh, I think as many of you will recall, we've talked extensively about uh, retail around this table uh, and, and really trying to identify the barriers and opportunities to creating a healthy and sustainable retail environment um, has emerged as a priority, uh, both for the community and DGRI, and I think is, has led to some of our programs and policy decisions over the years, um, including our retail innovation grant um, and some of the events uh, and programs that we've been doing. So I think given the moment and recognizing the significant impacts that COVID uh, is and uh, is having and um, will continue to have, um, we wanted to make sure uh, that we had a sense of where we are today and, and what we can expect in the next six, uh, six 12 or 18 months as this plays out. Um, and we're doing that uh, with, with MJB um, through conversations with stakeholders, um, including brokers, owners, uh, small business owners, to get a sense of what they're experiencing in real time. Um, also note in your packet, we included um, some of the monthly tracking that we're doing internally. Uh, I'll give a shout out to Marion on our team, who's been uh, really taking on the, um, the task of tracking new business openings, um, also closings, but foot as well as foot traffic parking and some of the other metrics that are included in that monthly report. Uh, I think the second reason we wanted to get into this uh, work was really to start to frame out a strategy for going forward. So you want to get a sense of where we are, where we can expect things to go, but importantly, how do we take that information and translate it into policy decisions and, and program development? So. Uh, so as I mentioned, we brought in MJB um, to help us with some of this work. Um, they are known um, in the the retail world and universe um, really for their specialty in downtowns and main streets across the country. So Mike Byrne, um, as I mentioned, is here and he's going to walk us through uh, some of his initial findings. Um, I'll point out this is just kind of an informational update. We will have a final report for you in the next uh, few months. Um, but wanted to give you a chance to see what we've been finding and learning. So um, with that, Mike, I will kick it over to you. Thanks, Tim. Uh, my uh, sound OK? Yeah. And Loud how and much and how much time uh, are we going with? Um, I know it's already about 8.55. Yeah, um, I might look to uh, the, Mr. Chair on that. Uh, do you have a sense? I think we originally budgeted 15 for this. Um, I think I think we can do the 15 minutes. Okay, we can keep it as is. If any, I'll point out if anyone does need to depart early, we are recording this and are happy to share afterward. So, Mike, I think you can stick with your original uh, budget. Okay. Of time. All right. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, as Tim said, this is only a phase one. Um, the way we structured this, uh, the first phase was kind of an analysis of, of, of where we are and where we're headed, uh, especially given COVID. And the second phase was more tactical, was more about what could be done about it. This might seem backwards to some of you in as much as, you know, the whole focus these last nine, 10 months has been trying to get the, get the relief, get the assistance out the door as quickly as possible. Um, but to some degree, we actually wanted to see how this played out first before getting too specific with what more um, might be done. And it was also ordered this way because we felt strategy has to be based on analysis of the broader context and trajectory. Um, so that was the thinking. But I did want to say that up front because it might seem a little bit backwards uh, why we didn't start with the tactical 
uh, first. Um, <clears throat> so in this phase one, um, uh, let it be said uh, before any of this, I've actually uh, been to Grand Rapids multiple times, um, uh, thankfully, uh, because um, you know that 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 background knowledge helped a lot in trying to do this scope remotely. Um, I've spent a lot of time on Google Earth and talking to Tim um, to make sure I've got a very up to date sense. Um, also looked at you know available data sets and reports about where retail has, how retail has been doing since COVID started um, uh, in Grand Rapids. Had discussions with quite a few uh, property owners and leasing professionals, and I'm in the process of talking with um, merchants. Uh, and then also kind of comparing this to what I've been seeing across the country. I'm working in a number of communities right now, which are uh, in the process of developing uh, retail recovery strategies. So uh, looking at it in that context as well. So just a few um, slides on, on what's, what's happening nationally, uh, and then I'll proceed to, to talk more specifically about downtown Grand Rapids. Obviously, central business districts were hit hard by this um, uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, obviously, uh, remote work, um, the you know, convention visitor trade pretty much disappeared. Um, and unlike neighborhoods, um, a lot of CBDs, uh, while they've had a growing residential base over the last couple decades, it's still relatively modest. Um, and so that was not able to fill in um, like it was in many urban neighborhoods um, with, with people staying uh, pretty close to home. Also, our CBDs in, in downtown Grand Rapids, no exception, uh, had become quite reliant on the experiential economy. And when I say experiential, including food and beverage, live music, um, events, um, and, and, this, and that economy is what's really been pummeled um, over the last year. And then finally, a lot of CBDs um, are, are all about small businesses, and, and they've been hit comparatively harder um, <clears throat> uh, um, across the board. Um, so it hit hard, um, but that said, uh, a lot of businesses have actually um, – uh, stayed afloat, if not thrived during all of this. And, and there tends to be a, a common formula. These are just some of the aspects of that formula. Um, those businesses that are able to, to sell outside, obviously food and beverage, um, most notable there. Uh, businesses that have other revenue sources besides walk-in traffic. Um, businesses that kind of adapted what they sold uh, in a way that made them essential. Um, <clears throat> PPP should not, uh, you know, with all the, the, the initial issues with its rollout was critical in keeping a lot of businesses above the line, as well as other state and local relief programs. Community goodwill, uh, impressive how in a number of communities, uh, businesses that had local following were able to fundraise significant dollars through GoFundMe. Um, uh, cost cutting, obviously. Um, receptive landlords, uh, and in some states, uh, eviction moratoriums. All of this uh, to put together um, has actually uh, um, uh, mitigated uh, some of the carnage uh, that we were expecting to see. <clears throat> um, and indeed, uh, there has been less carnage in, in, in retail than, than was initially expected. Um, just one example, the other day, uh, CoreSight Research, which is a source the industry often looks to, um, to catalog number of retail closures, um, they were predicting throughout the year, and this was reported, um, uh, re you know, repeatedly in, in, in newspaper articles, that there would be 20 to 25,000 store closures in 2020. The actual number at the end of 2020 was 8,721 which actually was less than the 9,832 in 2019. Um, furthermore, you've probably read some articles saying there's going to be 100,000 to 110,000 restaurant closures in 2020 when all said and done. Um, not a small number. Um, uh, probably about 17% uh, of the total restaurants in the country. Uh, what's interesting, and I'm still looking for a number for how many restaurants close in the average year, 
We do know that roughly seven, anything between 17 to 27 percent of restaurants do close in their first year of business. So all of this is not to, to minimize what's happened or, or how this how difficult this year was for businesses, but um, to say that it hasn't been as uh, as much of an existential event for the retail industry as was predicted back in March and April. There is also a lot of reason to be somewhat more optimistic about 2021. Obviously, we're starting from a low bar there. There wasn't much cause for optimism at all last year. But there is an aspect of this where the businesses that have survived have, have been able to demonstrate a certain level of resourcefulness um, and it suggests that, you know, these might have been among the stronger merchants that we had. And so you can expect, again, this is theoretical, that you'd have a, a reduced failure rate going forward. I don't, I also don't want to underestimate the boost that we'll get from this second, second stimulus, this, this, this new round of PPP, as well as the $15 billion that will be going towards uh, live venues um, that hopefully um, will get us uh, further down the road towards mass vaccination. Um, and then the economic rebound that's expected as a result of that, there clearly has been for months pent up demand. Um, and I also remind you that uh, economic downturns are always times when there is a huge increase in entrepreneurialism. And this has so far proven not to be at all different in that respect. Uh, number of business openings has actually increased uh, in 2020. Um, and finally, the expectation that the tenant landlord relationship has shifted uh, with the tenant uh, having much more leverage than they did just a few years ago, uh, uh, even more than they had in January, and that rents uh, have been dropping. Um, all of these are reasons to actually uh, uh, have some optimism about retail this year. Um, <clears throat> now, there's quite a bit of uncertainty with all of this, uh, some of it well-known and, and widely reported, some of it... Uh, um, that's been less discussed. I wonder about generational change. Uh, the millennials are in family formation mode. Um, uh, uh, they, you know, and so now we're really talking about Gen Z, and it's not, uh, it's not um, certain that they will show they will have the same spending habits. Indeed, I've long wondered what would happen if Gen Z rediscovered cooking, and what that would mean for all the restaurants and bars we have. And indeed. Um, there has been uh, a huge surge in purchases of kitchen equipment uh, during COVID. We'll see if that sticks. That is something to, to, to watch closely. Anchor prospects, um, most notably movie theaters, if any of you have been following what's been going on in that industry. Um, uh, uh, recent announcements by uh, Warner Media that they're going to release films um, in movie theaters the same day those films appear on HBO Max, at least for the next year. Um, uh, now, I don't count the movie theater industry out because people have been doing that since the 1950s, and they're still with us. And actually, we're doing quite well before COVID. Um, but that said, you know, there are some questions here about whether there'll be some contraction there. Um, for what it's worth, JD doesn't think there's uh, any chance that the one downtown will be closing um, uh, he's, he's actually quite bullish on that, uh, still, um, landlord flexibility, uh, just because you would think rents would decline a bit, um, and landlords would be more, uh, eager to sign leases doesn't necessarily mean that they are. Um, <clears throat> and sometimes they just can't, uh, uh, for reasons having to do with, with the terms of their mortgage or whatever, what, what have you. Um, uh, so we don't know about that. Um, there still are landlords who seem to be acting in a way today uh, that suggests it was still 19 and uh, still 2018. Um, although those are more the exceptions than the rules. Um, <clears throat> I would say remote work. We don't know where that's going. I have my opinions about that, but we could talk about that later if, if you'd like. Uh, business travel um, is expected to decline somewhat over the longer haul. Um, uh, but again, 
that remains an open question. And finally, and this is one that's rarely remarked upon, um, it, and this always is the way it works, uh, n new formats that have generated a lot of excitement in downtown settings over the last decade, whether they're food halls or what have you, over time, they start to appear in more conventional suburban shopping centers. And that's indeed what's going to happen um, uh, and, and was already happening uh, before COVID. Um, you're starting to see, just to take food halls as an example, some pretty hip looking food halls in some very conventional suburban shopping centers. And what that means is downtown's going to have to stay ahead of the curve and, and you know, and innovate uh, and iterate uh, what has been working for them so that, um, so that they're not in direct competition. Um, they, they, they are kind of pioneering because that's, that's where they excel. That's their competitive advantage. Um, so, uh, so Grand Rapids, downtown Grand Rapids, obviously a lot of momentum um, for COVID, uh, uh, you know, downtown Grand Rapids, Grand Rapids as a whole uh, uh, has long been a medium sized city that punches well above its weight. And in retail, um, that's been the case as well. Uh, even Tupelo Honey, um, which is a very successful chain in the Southeast. Uh, I believe this is their first Midwestern location. Uh, they decide to, 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 to introduce themselves to this part of the country in Grand Rapids. Same with Canopy by Hilton. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, it really did seem like a city that was firing on all cylinders. Um, and so that gets me to some of the bigger picture strategic issues and questions that I kind of want to throw out there for your feedback. Because I think um, these really do, uh, the answers really do dictate uh, how we approach the tactical uh, component of this. Um, you, know, uh, it, it, you know, obviously, uh, and you've probably heard this before, uh, downtowns are not the downtowns they were um, and, and, and aren't necessarily going to be those sorts of downtowns anytime soon, right? Downtown as the primary shopping destination of a regent, um, that's many decades ago. Um, at this point, the primary shopping destination has already iterated a couple times, right? I mean, in Woodlands Mall, we have Breton Village. Um, so downtown has successfully, I might add, in the last uh, couple decades, happened upon a new paradigm, and Grand Rapids has really nailed that paradigm, right? Um, uh, you know, you could sum it up in terms of the experiential economy, but it's not just that. Um, you know, it's also the residential push in downtowns. Uh, it's also the, um, you know, the doubling down on, on, the, uh, on the, the history and the character uh, and, the, and, and the uniqueness of the place. This was not something, obviously, that downtowns were doing in, in the 70s and the 80s. There was more of an effort to replicate what seemed to be working in the suburbs. In the 90s, there was a clear shift. Um, and, and again, Grand Rapids has done very well with this model. Um, uh, and, and, you know, the unfortunate reality of COVID is that it kind of hit that model, you know, right in the stomach. It was a real gut punch. Um, uh, but, um, but I just felt I needed to say from the outset that that's the paradigm that's been working in downtown now for a few decades. Um, and that the era of downtown as the primary shopping destination of a region uh, has long since passed. Um, now, there's a question about the drivers of consumer demand in downtowns, right? Um, uh, you know, I, and, and a lot of attention has rightly gone to the increase in, in, in downtown residential, both in downtown Grand Rapids uh, and in other downtowns. Um, uh, we're now at about, I think, 6,000, right? Um, you know, and I, and I think we should be clear about, um, you know, all of the different uh, drivers that we're playing with. Um, there is the downtown residential base. And the reason they're so important is, first of all, first of all they're somewhat captive um, in a sense, uh, but just in generally, they're gonna be more likely and more um, certain uh, to spend their dollars downtown and to spend more of their dollars in downtown. Um, than residents elsewhere. Plus, they were a, a hedge during COVID, um, right? In as much as, again, people were staying close to home. Um, 
Now, there's these other pieces that are quite prominent in downtown Grand Rapids as well. And when, and when I say trade area population, um, that is to say that oftentimes retail in a downtown rises and falls on the basis of not just the people who live in the downtown proper, but also the people who live in the near neighborhoods, even suburban day trippers from elsewhere in Kent County, right? Um, and, and that, you know, and, and we don't want to lose sight of the, the reality that um, downtown needs to also speak to that broader trade area. Because in the end, 6,000 residents is great. It it's only gets you so far in terms of supporting downtown Grand Rapids retail footprint, right? So it's, I don't see it as an either or sort of thing. I think it has to be both. And then the captive submarket, something that, again, downtown Grand Rapids has been very good with. Uh, these are people here for other reasons, for conventions, uh, for events, um, for festivals, um, for their daytime office, right? And they're kind of captive in as much as they're less likely to leave, say, for lunch or for coffee. Um, they might, um, but they're less likely to just because of the inconvenience of it. Um, or like if you're going uh, to the arena for a show, you, 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 you know, will you eat in downtown before that? Will you go to a bar in downtown after that? Probably more likely. So that's why I say these are captive. Um, and they're an important piece of this too. Um, so again, I don't think this is either or, but I think all three of these are, are, are critical uh, in downtown and we can't lose sight of any of them. Um, that said, you know, every downtown reaches a point at which one can build it and they no longer seem to come, right? Um, there is a ceiling to these things. There's a ceiling on the consumer side um, and there's a ceiling on the tenant side, right? Um, there's a lot of retail, not all of it, but a lot of retail in downtown and in your neighborhoods that focuses on a relatively narrow psychographic what I call neo hipster urbanites. Um, and, you know, not only is there a ceiling to the number of people who kind of fit that description and spend their money that way, um, but also they have more options than they did back in the late 90s, right? Um, whether it's uptown going forward, there'll probably be more in Monroe North along Plainfield Avenue in Creston. Um, they have other options, right? So we have a ceiling to that demand and more competition for it. Um, so there is definitely a need to broaden the draw. And, and part of that is, um, again, that trade area population from further afield. Part of it also, you know, there's a lot of emphasis and rightly so on uh, minority business ownership. There's, there's much less um, about uh, minority consumers and the kinds of retail that appeal um, to the extent that, you know, again, um, there are many different slices of that submarket as well, but there's rarely much talk about the kinds of, uh, of retail that would have a, 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 a crossover appeal to a number of different submarkets. And I, and I think that that, uh, that is a way of expanding um, the demand as well. Okay, a few more points I want to make. Um, this is a large downtown and it sprawls. Um, if you think about the distance between downtown market and Bridge Street, um, and you think about walking that distance in the middle of winter, um, uh, you know, that's, that, that's not something you necessarily want to do. Uh, and the value of clustering in retail, it's called co-tenancy. Um, I can't uh, overstate that. Um, and, and there's a couple of reasons why it's so important. Um, one, you maximize the synergies between adjacent businesses, um, which is especially important when you're talking about soft goods. We talk about clothes, shoes, uh, that kind of shopping. Um, and you also maximize the marketing impact um, of the retail mix. If you, if you collected all the businesses that are in downtown Grand Rapids, um, it's an incredibly impressive list. But that effect is diluted because it's so it's spread across such a large footprint. Um, so the need, uh, you know, the need to to determine, okay, 
You need to cluster, but cluster where? And, and, and you know, and, and I don't want to, I don't want to uh, act like we just get to choose that. Um, ultimately, the market decides where it wants to cluster. Um, you know, the the one that come that seems most intuitive is Monroe Center, just because of its uh, its history uh, uh, as the shopping street for downtown Grand Rapids. But it's obviously struggled to gain some traction in that regard over the years. Um, there's the Arena District, but that's mostly food and beverage. Um, e- even even Studio Park, mostly food and beverage. Downtown Market. Um, as an anchor, yes, but there's connectivity issues. Um, Division Ave, um, there's a, a lot of inventory there, but there's work to do. Um, if, if that's ever to become kind of a a, 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 a shopping destination, um, the frankly, the place where I imagine m- most most uh, most retail tenants want to be is Bridge Street, not only because of the momentum, but also because of the because uh, of the Bridge Street market anchor. Grocery anchors are golden these days, right? Those are guaranteed foot traffic generators. Um, all sorts of retailers want to be near them, including uh, including soft goods, including the clothing stores. Now, the problem is that there have been boutiques along Bridge Street; they have failed. Um, and at this point, because of the food and beverage there. The rents are probably a little too high uh, to be sustainable for 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 shops for most shops. Um, so so the question of clustering where um, you know and I kind of throw that out there to some degree. Uh, let me also kind of uh, suggest a few other things. Um, one and maybe this sounds blasphemous. Um, the the notion that especially with soft goods we stop trying to push a big boulder up a steep hill um, and we can see that hey you know. Uh, to the extent that there's that there's demand for that um, in the core of Grand Rapids versus, say, you know, Woodlands, 28th Street, Burton Village, you know, it's most likely an uptown. Um, uh, they're much further along uh, in that regard. Um, they have a lot more co-tenancy already. Um, and then the challenge is one of improving the connectivity and the transit links between the two, right? And at the same time, retaining downtown's role um, as a sort of incubator. Um, And that's clearly a a function that it's been playing already. If you look at the businesses that have quote unquote graduated from division uh, to wealthy, right? Um, uh, So that's one possibility. The other possibility is to say, you know what, we're going to make this happen. And, And let me say a few words about that. You know, it is, you know, it is becoming increasingly obvious that retail, especially in a downtown setting, it's not a market proposition. Um, but if you know, people aren't building things in downtowns for the retail. Um, rather, retail is the amenity that can drive visitation and rent premiums, right? Um, and so there, you know, even, even JD's, would, you know, his, his point was that, you know, he wanted to build a cinema in downtown, um, but it was a sort of passion play. And that's, you know, that's what he believed in. And he was willing to do what was necessary to make it happen in terms of the rest of their portfolio. Um, so, you know, I, I think to see retail in, in this light is a little different um, than how we've historically uh, thought about it, you know, and and there are ways of uh, of of of, crea- of um, establishing a coordinated effort, um, uh, like was done, for instance, in downtown Holland, um, where you're actually working together on on the types of ground floor businesses. Um, uh, you know, you're you're even considering different sorts of, of deal structures and your major property owners are, 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 are again working in a coordinated fashion to make something like this happen. And frankly, this is not something I recommend in a lot of places. Grand Rapids is one of the few places where I would just because of the history, the track record of public private partnership, the fact that so much of the real estate is in relatively few hands. Um, 
uh, you know, and, and what I sense is a real sort of um, uh, a, a real sort of interest among some major stakeholders in, in making downtown retail uh, work. Um, again, Grand Rapids is one of the only cities where I would be suggesting something like this, but I think here is a place where it could actually be feasible. Um, okay, so what's next? Well, this next phase, I'm going to be looking more closely at um, the existing programs and capacities and resources of different stakeholders, uh, having conversations directly with them, looking at the zoning the regulatory framework, um, and then hopefully when we when we talk when we meet again virtually, um, either at the end of February or March, uh, I'll have more to report there. But for now, I just want to throw out some of those ideas and, and, and see, you know, how they played and what your feedback would be. And, and that will help to inform where we go from here. Tim, uh, that is the last slide, I think. That's great. Thanks, Mike. Um, Mr. Chair, do we want to allow any time for questions or discussion? Yeah, I think so. Does anyone have questions for Mike? I mean, I, I think personally I'd, I'll be interested in the tactical phase um, and the recommendations that you come up with. Mm -hmm. I, I, I feel like I, I do think it's a correct analogy to say we're pushing a rock up a hill. Mm -hmm. I feel like that. Uh, COVID only exacerbated that even more. Yeah. Uh, but um, but I think there's a real desire to to really make downtown, you know, more active retail wise. Um, and how we go about that is crucial. Yeah. Looks uh, like someone has their hand up. Uh, yeah, member Seeger and um, member McNeely. Okay, how about Seeger? She's been rather quiet. Which is surprising, I know. <laughs> so I just a, a comment, and this has more to do with my longevity uh, on this earth, uh, is that I'm reminded of about 50 years ago, while I was not as, you know, uh, was the comments of Dick Gillette. And Dick Gillette, and this, Mike, it has to do with your comments about the whole, the clustering of businesses and, and whatever. And uh, he was strong on trying to keep downtown in a compact uh, area. And I always thought that rather strange in a way. But um, uh, I, you know, I think that your comments with regard to where will the concentration of businesses could be and, and all that, I'm reminded of, sometimes it's good to just kind of be reminded of what some of our leaders uh, have said in the past and, and how, particularly as we look at the growth of businesses as uh, moving west on, on Bridge Street. Now, he was very concerned when, um, uh, when the Barnum building was, I can't remember the original name, um, Bridgewater was, was, uh, was built and he was very concerned about what that would do. So, um, I think to heed kind of these comments and I will be very eager to hear how this all transpires in your more tactical pieces. So thank you. Okay. Thanks Diana. Thank you. Great. Yeah, so um, sort of a um, one of those wh why questions that that maybe uh, could be addressed in a subsequent document. But what what are the uh, the benefits that a city gets from increased retail? Mm -hmm. um, you know, aside from in, in not to dismiss them, but customer experience, patron experience, citizen experience. Um, but is it uh, is it important for the mix of wealth creation? job creation, tax revenue development. Um, just, just wondering what sort of the formula is of benefit for the effort. Yeah, that's, um, that's a fair question. I think that, um, you know, I, I think that retail is, retail is one of the important elements 
to attracting the end users that do more directly uh, generate the wealth creation, um, at least in this day and age. I mean, certainly there's the presumption that a lively uh, street life is essential for getting knowledge workers to want to work in a place and live in a place. Um, it certainly has an impact on where conference planners want to stage conventions. Um, uh, uh, it's, not, it's obviously not the only piece or even the most important piece in that, in that equation, um, but it, it no doubt plays a role. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I think that's the shift in thinking is that retail is this amenity that allows for more visitation and higher rents and property values, um, even if in and of itself, it's not necessarily going to be a great money maker. Um, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, I, th I think that's, that's, that's the argument that can be, uh, made, uh, and, and, and rather conclusively demonstrated, um, at least in a downtown setting. So Mike, um, that goes to your point of, we might need to look at this as an amenity. Yeah. As opposed to, uh, an engine for growth. I, right. I think, yeah. I think the. Greg, to uh, to piggyback, uh, being in the convention business, um, uh, next to food and beverage, mm -hmm. um, probably the most often asked question is, how many restaurants do you have and how close are they to where I'm staying? Right. Um, retail is an often asked question as well. Where right. can I shop? So I, I think it, does enhance the ability for, say, um, for us to to uh, you know set ourselves uh, in a better light for meeting planners when they're choosing cities. Yeah, and I think that what I would add to that too is, you know, I, I often say this that that retail has kind of a privileged position among the land uses in the sense that for visitors. Um, especially, you know, who don't know a place, it's the one and only thing they actually can see and assess, right? I mean, you know, we don't necessarily know what's going on upstairs. Um, and for better or for worse, people draw conclusions, consciously or not, based on the retail they see. Um, and so, uh, while it, it's not necessarily a growth creator in a downtown setting, um, you know, it, 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 it has kind of a disproportionate impact on how a place is perceived. Um, uh, and in as much as that relates to wealth creation, um, you know, it, it's quite relevant. I, you know, I'm not saying so that retail isn't a growth creator outside of a, a downtown or urban setting, but in a downtown urban setting, um, you know, uh, it generally is better thought of as an amenity, I think. Um, Mail, do you have a question as well? Um, yeah, kind of question and statement. I kind of <laughs> lost a little bit. I forgot what I was going to say. But essentially, <laughs> um, what one of my, I guess one of my questions, and, and this is just more of a thought, I guess, is that, you know, we got to always consider, um, you know, who are we building, if you will, downtown for? Mm -hmm. um, you know, in a lot of the inner city areas, um, when the word gentrification gets introduced or reintroduced, what happens there is that some developers are changing the infrastructure of a community for the people who they want to come there. Um, and usually in that setting, if, if we're talking about, let's just say, you know, an, um, a, a predominantly um, Black or Latino area that then gets introduced to gentrification, usually that's, um, white developers coming in to build or rebuild a community that is attractive to white people um, coming <clears> in. So that's, that's the entity that they sometimes desire to see coming in as opposed to saying, how do we enhance what's already there for those who are there? And then if other people come, that's cool. Well, when I'm thinking about the downtown, 
you know, we've, we've talked extensively about the number of black owned businesses downtown, black minority owned businesses downtown. And, you know, when Malamaya opened up in the downtown market at that moment, we were in 2013, we were the second black owned business with a storefront in downtown Grand Rapids. The other one was local mocha, the coffee shop that mm. is next door to Madcap Coffee. And they were there first. And then Madcap came and put their shop literally sharing the same wall as them. And now they're, they've been struggling every since to keep their business going. Mm. Um, and so then, and then we had, um, um, you know, the, the conversations of ambiance coming up, a black owned lounge, then GR Noir and Mosby's Popcorn and Mel Styles. And so I think we kind of got excited over four additional black owned businesses. But um, this, this conversation that Mike had brought up, he, he, he talked about, you know, the, the diversification, if you will, of those who are coming downtown and enjoying downtown. And I have to tell you that when I look out of my business window at Studio Park, it's rare that I'm seeing people who look like me sitting inside the greenhouses or sitting at picnic tables um, or in the tent, as well as when I drive around other parts um, of the city. And so, you know, <clears throat> it's like, how do, we, how do we enhance what we have while attracting um, a different clientele, a more diverse clientele, more diverse group of people. And one of the ways that I see that being, and I don't have all the answers, obviously, but, and I can't speak for everybody, but one of the ways and thoughts is like, let's talk about um, ownership. Like who owns the buildings downtown? You know, um, who owns the buildings downtown that could bring in and who have a vision for bringing in, um, you know, more uh, businesses of color, more um groups and things of that nature, because I believe that that would be one way to um, kickstart um, that trend um, of, of a more diverse group of people being downtown, enjoying downtown, feeling comfortable downtown, mm -hmm. and saying and showing who's owning some of the buildings and some of the real estate. Otherwise, us as people of color, we have to go through the same hoops every single time to try to get a teaspoon of square footage or loans or whatever it is um, for for the downtown, um, and to and to have our voices heard, and so you know, and the work that that you're doing, Mike, I appreciate um, some of the the statistics that you've shown, as well as what um, uh, what DJI staff has put together in terms of the numbers of people, you know, walking around, traffic counts, and things of that nature. But I, you know, I, I never want us to forget that not only do we want to attract businesses of color downtown. And, and, and help them uh, get off the ground and keep them going. But we also wanna think about what other things that we need to have in place to attract the, the um, you know, shoppers of color, the, those who are gonna stay in the hotel, those who are gonna be at the conventions and things of that nature. And some of, some of the organizations that I've spoken to in the past that looked at downtown was like, well, it doesn't seem like it is, um, you know, that place where many of us see ourselves at. Um, mm. And so I think, you know, I, I feel like before COVID, we were kind of um, moving in that direction. Obviously, COVID, you know, changed some things. But again, we just can't, um, I just don't want us to lose sight of that. And again, I got to also speak on the 41% of Black-owned businesses that have closed and shut their doors between yeah. April and then the end of June. Yeah. Um, now that number doesn't speak of those who um, have been doggy paddling and who are just about to just stop and say forget it. But you know, let's keep let's keep that in mind. So I, you know, I, I wanted to bring it to our attention, and I, and I hate to always be the person of color that's pushing some of those numbers and statistics and whatnot. But if I don't, who will? Well, you know, I you made a number of great points, and yeah, I certainly do not want to minimize the fact that the 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 pain caused by the, the pain among small businesses caused by this uh, pandemic has certainly been disproportionately allocated. Let's put it that way. Um, uh, just like other aspects of this, uh, of this virus. Um, so uh, yeah, the incidence of small business failures definitely has correlated with uh, income demographics um, uh, since the beginning of this. I, and I also, you know, I mean, I, I, and that's, but in terms of what you were saying before, I, yeah, that's partly why I tried to emphasize that it's not only about 
minority owned businesses. I think it's also about minority owned consumers um, and, and uh, and what sorts of retail kind of has a, 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 a you know, a sort of crossover appeal that, that draws in, that, that cuts across, you know, whether it be uh, cultural or socioeconomic lines. You know, frankly, that's also such an opportunity because a lot of these districts to the, to the south or southwest, they don't, there's not that much retail there, um, you know, and so it's an opportunity of, uh, in a way as well. So, yeah, I, I take your point, um, and, and and I yeah, I'd like the focus in that respect to be, to broaden uh, beyond just the business owners, as important as that is, and also include the consumers. Um, okay, thank you. Thank so, you. appreciate all these comments; they're really important. Um, but in the interest of time, um, yeah, I, I, we Mike really appreciate your report and I think everybody's looking forward to the next phase which is what the heck should we do right? yeah yeah so, so appreciate that and um you know we'll look forward to having you back great thanks yeah. a lot thanks, sorry uh, yeah thanks. sorry I went on for a little long uh, no you're good uh, it's all good, good discussion yeah. yeah great thanks a lot okay next uh Mr Kelly do you have your report I do yeah and I can uh, in the interest of time um, I know we have one public comment um, I can keep things brief um, want to highlight really just two things uh, first is that in your packet for this month I included a memo uh, that went to the city commission uh, for their meeting yesterday some outlining some of the homelessness efforts that they've been engaged in over the past uh, several months so uh, just wanted to point that out and then um, also mention that uh, Tammy Britton who's the city's homelessness coordinator um, will be in attendance at the February meeting to give uh, A to introduce yourself, but then B to kind of give an overview of some of that work. So if, uh, if you didn't have a chance, I'd encourage you to take a look at that memo um, when you have a moment. Um, and then I there's- Not to interrupt, but I, I do think, the, um, you know, the Portland Lou is a is a great example of providing an amenity to, to help the heart side and uh, really the success that it's had is showing that you know it's well received and um hopefully will continue to be so so absolutely and i as um i think we've talked about around these tables before the ambassadors are often coordinating um with the homeless outreach team that the city has put together um in which they are currently expanding and so i think that collaboration coordination will continue into the future and um yeah as we as we've seen with the portland Lou, there are um, some success stories out there um, and we'll just continue um to to push that message around um, so uh, what I was going to say is a lot of a lot of other work going on. I think the one thing I want to make sure I highlight is that um, hopefully you're all aware that the world of winter kicks off in two days. Um, we so m much of our team is um, all hands on deck getting that event ready, coordinated, um, and um, you know just kind of putting the word out. So want to point out our website worldofwintergr.com, which has our updated calendar, description of the artwork and activities that are going on. Um, it's got a map to let you know where things are located and we'll constantly update it as programming and activities are happening. That message is being put out um, far and wide on a, a several fronts for a marketing campaign. Uh, first, of course, our social media channels, um, which have a little over 60,000 followers. Um, we're also doing paid advertising on social media um, targeted within about a 30 mile range of downtown. Uh, we have radio spots that will be coming online uh, or are already online, I should say, at WYCE La Mejor Michigan Radio. Uh, print pieces in review um, and then thanks to Joe Agustinelli and Outfront Media, we also have seven billboards um, on major major freeways and corridors in the area. Uh, including 131, 196, M6, and 96. Um, the, this week, um, the Hibikozo sculptures that I think you've all got a, a glimpse of are actually being installed as we speak. Um, the team was over there yesterday getting them in and testing out the lighting, so those will be ready to go this week. The, um, the Seesaw Teeter Totter Impulse um, from Creos will be coming next week, um, but there are several activities happening over the weekend, uh, and our hope is that People will come down. Um, obviously, we want them to be safe um, and recognize the the coronavirus protocols. Um, but nonetheless, we want them to come out um, and support local businesses. So we we talked 
uh, during Mike's presentation around the kind of the power of supporting local um, and a number of the businesses that we've supported, including the marketplace at Studio Park, GR Noir, and many others are open for business. So we encourage everyone to come down, um, enjoy the art and activities, um, and if able to, uh, to spend some money to support our businesses. So uh, with that, uh, happy to take any questions. I, I think the timing's great for all of these uh, winter structures that are we just approved. Um, that'll be around for you know the winter wonderland that we're creating. So absolutely, yeah. yeah and as Mark said, there's several that are already up. Uh, we'll see more of those start to uh, emerge in the in the next couple of weeks. So there's plenty to do, um, and we we hope that the community will come out. Okay, any questions for Mr. Kelly? If not, the uh, we move to public comment. Um, if there's anyone in the public that would like to make a statement. Um, yes, can you hear me? So yes, Scott, I can hear you. I'm going to ask Amanda if she could put up page 74 of the agenda packet. Yeah. I don't want to share my screen. Last time it messed up the technical ability to talk. Yes, and I can't even believe this, but my computer is frozen and I can't advance the screen. I don't know if you want me. To, yeah, it's it's the overhead view of downtown at Rosa Park Circle, Pearl and Monroe. It should be the next slide, although. Nope, there. keep going down two more. Not that one. I might need to leave the meeting and come back. Well, oh, no, not ne the next one, that one. Perfect. Thank you. So my name is Scott Atchison. I'm going to try to convince you again. You guys need to make a long term investment for an information center in downtown to let everybody know what's open. I have a question for you. What's open right now? I mean, nobody knows what's open. And that is one of the purposes of this information booth for restaurant and bars. Every day, they'll make a daily menu matrix that would let everybody know it's open, specific for downtown, one mile or less from Pearl and Monroe. Leonard Street, no information. East Town, no information. Downtown Market, yes. Bridge Street, yes. Specific for downtown. You know, it's got to be at Pearl and Monroe. Why would anyone want to hide an information center inside another building? That's what we've been doing in Grand Rapids for years. We want to hide it inside another building. People walk right by it and don't even know it's there. You know, the location is so important. It's in between the DeVos Place and Van Andel Arena. It's surrounded by all the nice hotels, you know, and, um, you know, think about the events we're going to have coming up here. The Riverbank runs coming back. Art Prize might be coming back. But I'm going to be real, you know, quick here. I don't want to, you guys should look over the other two handouts in here. It basically says, you know, what? But we, nobody knows what's open. And if you want to stay ahead of the curve and be innovative, Grand Rapids needs to have the best information booth that lets everybody know what's open every day. And for Bars and restaurants, food specials, the daily menu matrix will change every day as a reflection of what's happening in downtown. And Mike, um, Burn, I, yeah. sent you, I sent you copies of these handouts to your email during the meeting. Yep, and I, think, saw it. and I think everybody, what Mark Miller said, what Tim Kelly said, you know, what the consultant said, an information booth every day of the year would help everyone. I'm not going to take up any more of your time, but this would be good for everyone to create new business and make everybody feel part of downtown. A virtual goodbye. All right, Scott. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate it. Okay, next. Is there any other public would like to make a statement? Okay, next is board member discussion. Is there any board member that would like to? Give us some knowledge and um, help us prepare for the next go round of COVID or anything interesting in your personal lives or 
that you would like to make public. <laughs> uh, feel free. Um, I would like to say, I mean, this has um, certainly been probably one of the most stressful years that we probably have incurred in our lifetimes. Um, uh, and, you know, it does help. I wish we could meet person to person and one day we will, but it does help uh, seeing everybody and, um, you know, still being able to communicate, I think is so important. This board is extremely important for what's happening, particularly downtown. Um, and Tim, just, you know, you and your team should be commended. I mean, you're, uh, you're really working hard to make things better under uh, extreme conditions. So I think we'll be better for it. I think the things that we're doing, honestly, uh, are um, not just short term fixes. Uh, it, it they are, I think they're going to have a life after COVID. Um, and I think it's going to be better for downtown. So I, for one, am encouraged by what, everything we're doing. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any other comments or? All right, it's great to see everybody. Um, thanks, Mike, again. Um, and this meeting is now adjourned. Thanks, everyone. Happy New Year. Thank you. Happy New Year. Have a great week.